All right, welcome everyone to the first strategy lecture of the 2024 Richinomi calendar. Uh, today we have Max, also known as Light Pink Yoshi here, one of the few eight dons in the US of A, here to talk about intermediate and advanced Richie Mahjong tips and concepts. I'll let him take over from here. Hi, uh, like Eric said, my name is Max, uh, better known as Light Pink Yoshi. I play this game way too much, and I wanted to make a slideshow. So this is what that is. Uh, this is meant more to be a standalone resource that will be publicly available after this presentation, more than like a call and response thing. So it is much more text heavy than like your typical slideshow. Um, so apologies for that in advance. It's not going to present super well. But feel free to just let me know if you have any questions. And uh, I hope you all enjoy or learn something. Hopefully this has become, I was hoping that this could become like an ongoing project where I can just kind of put more things in as I think of more and more things. So if there's something that you want me to talk more in depth about or that I just didn't cover at all that you were curious about, feel free to let me know and I'll type something up and we can figure out where it goes. But anyway, yeah. So like I said, the goal of this is just to be another mid to high level resource that's available legally in English. Uh, I will be posting it publicly later on once I figure out where to host it and make some edits based on feedback here. Uh, there's a wide range of topics, but we will get to all of them. And also, this will be recorded and posted on the Richinomi YouTube channel sometime later in the future, I assume. So if you cannot be here for the entire evening, uh, do not worry. It will be there. Like Eric said, uh, my name is Max. I've been playing this game for close to 12 years now and currently sitting at 8 Dawn on Tenho, which to our... To my knowledge is the second highest rated player in the United States uh, by current rating. By peak, it's like somewhere between like third and fifth. Uh, there have been quite a few people that have done better than me and then just left <laughs> because it's just there are better places to play Maja. Um, I've had success on ladder. I've had success in tournaments. I've won individual tournaments in the US, Canada, and China, which is very exciting for me. Uh, I've also done two lectures previously for Ichinomi, uh, linked here. They, the first one was the COVID series about tournament strategies. And then the second one was a co-lecture with Steve about building value out of nothing. None of this really means all that much in the grand scheme of things. I mean, I happen to be somewhat good at a hobby that we all enjoy. But I do include this just to hopefully lend some, lend some credence to what essentially is just my opinion written down. Uh, this is a list of all the sources, most of the sources that I use for this book. Also, this lovely DM from Jersey Mike. <laughs> Thank you to everyone for helping me out. I definitely spammed quite a few people with uh, just questions and screenshots. Just like, hey, should I wear this? Or, hey, like, would this be a good idea? So, thank you again to everyone who helped out. And then, before we actually get into it, just a disclaimer. Like everything Mahjong... This is just one person's opinion on what is good or not good. And this is content that exists in a bubble. There will be hands where you will want to differ from what I say here, and that is perfectly valid. Sometimes the board state changes. Sometimes your score situation demands something else happen. And sometimes I might just be wrong. Also, we are not going to be going over basic tile efficiency or scoring. There are plenty of other resources for that. And this was aimed more at a or intermediate to advanced level of player. All right, so getting into it. We, uh, a few things we're going to go over. Um, early turn discard order. Uh, discard order. Um, a few complex shapes. Some Ricci Dama decisions. Uh, specifically cases where Dama is good, because that's something that trips up a lot of people. Um, so when to Sakagiri versus when to display efficiently. Um, Suji counting. When to open and how to open. Setting yourself up for your desired placing over multiple hands rather than just aiming for it all at once. General defensive ideas, um, tracking Tadashi and what it means, as well as when to Targiri or cut tiles from your own hand and replace them with the same tile. Basic wall reading, and then just how to go about utilizing some of these tips and improving in your own games. Okay. Early turn discard order. Uh, I am a big proponent of this. I think. Especially if you can clean up your first six turns, you will find yourself in just much better situations on average a lot of times. You'll have a lot less annoying backfires. It's a pretty straightforward order. 
uh, it goes single guess wins are generally equal to nines and ones that are blocked by sixes and fours, respectively. Nines blocked by sixes and ones blocked by fours are, of course, useless because if you, if you draw the two they, or the eight, they just connect to the six slash four. Oh, the single guess wins are typically a bit safer, though. So if you want to hold on to those for safety, if your hand is bad, that can work as well. Or if you want to hedge if only two. You always want to pri you always want to prioritize the east cut when you are not the dealer in south round because that is the single most damaging tile of the guest wins. Otherwise, I typically go by the player that I want to call the least. So typically, if I'm close to someone in points, I will cut their win first so that their hand has less potential. Um, da, 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 da. Follow those up, follow the guess wins up with ones and nines that are by themselves that don't have door acceptance. Those are typically slightly worse than your Yako Hat, your Dragons, your Seat and Round wins. Um, and then those are typically slightly worse than floating twos and eights. And floating twos and eights are typically worse than a single tile of the double wind. So south as south or east as east. Or yeah, east and east as east. Again, this is not always true, but it's just a general case. However, that is something that a lot of people at least know to some extent, but the next slide is a bit more in-depth. It's what to do when the door is the honor. Uh, when it's one of those honors, I pretty much just throw it to the end of that list. Uh, I will cut it after I will cut it after double east slash double south for myself or a floating two and eight. It, I mean, it also just depends on the hand. But once you get to that point, you should always be asking yourself the question, like, how much do I actually want to play this hand? Because you should always be at least somewhat prepared to deal with someone pulling the honor Dora if you do cut it. Because that's just an open manga that's now staring you in the face. And if your hand is bad, then why not just hold on to that Dora? and see, okay, say, hey, like, this hand isn't worth fighting if someone pawns, so I might as well just try to pair it up. Um, and if you do pair it up, great. And if someone else cuts it, then boom, you have your excuse to cut it. Like, I'm not saying never cut it. It's essentially just saying, like, consider whether or not your hand is actually, like, worth moving forward once you get to the point where you're cutting it. Another way to put this is just, like, cut it when it makes sense. Like, when you've gotten to... When you've efficiently made your five blocks and it's, like, the last floating honor slash weird tile in your hand. Oh, okay. Okay, anyway. A few complex shapes to be familiar with. Uh, this first one here, not the best quality because I just kind of ripped these from the uh, the Tenho tile generator, but this is, we call this Rianman and Kanchan. Uh, it's this typical like five, six, seven, seven, eight shape that accepts a six and a nine, but this three here also accepts the four. So there's no reason to let go of the four acceptance unless you have good reason in another shape. Um, this three connected pair with space in between them, the two, two, four, four, six, six. You should just all like almost always you should be cutting the middle tile. Uh, it allows the two six Sean poem is the overall best way to end up on from this shape and it also gives you two different chances to fill in just a normal run which can allow you to get pinfu um it's not worth cutting from the outside edges because then you're just hurt you're just generally hurting your final shapes a bit more often and the peco that you can sometimes get isn't really worth it and this one was kind of one i threw in for fun because it popped up uh in a game recently for me but this this one 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 three four five six seven like the Anko and then the connected San Menchan. You can cut a seven pin here to wait two three six pin, uh, which is interesting. And you can get it can get you extra an extra food buffer if you do ex ends up needing some points. Or the two five eight pin doesn't look particularly good. All right, Richie versus Damo. This is a bit more of the uh, the meat and potatoes of it, but this is more of just a bunch of situations where I think that Dama is worth consideration. Because, honestly, Ricci is really, really good. And even if I would... Honestly, even if I would Dama a hand, it's not like clicking Ricci is really wrong. It just might not be the most correct. The, uh, the Korak meme is, in fact, fairly relevant. Okay. It's a uh, very long text-based slide, but we'll go through it. 
Okay, so you should just consider Dom on the following situations. Your bad weight and reaching Elmi. Bad weight being one type of tile or three or less outs. Uh, you have at least three Han 40 Fu in value, a Yaku, and a bad to mediocre weight. So, like, if you have, like, Tanyaoi Peiko Dora and you're waiting a 7 on Kanchan or something, very reasonable to Dama. Uh, four Han 30 Fu Rianman after turn 7. I actually don't think turn 7 is correct there, but that's the... for the actual math, but that's, like, kind of the benchmark I use in my head. But if you're first row, four Han 30 Fu Rianman Tenpai, it's actually plus EV to reach it because you have such... Such a high win rate and such good odds at a Hanuman. Because if you sumo with Richie, it's just a guaranteed Hanuman. And you can even get up to Baimon with some Ipatsu luck or uh, someone D. And you can get Hanuman with someone dealing in plus Aero 1, since they all likely do not have that many safe tiles. First, head start Rianman Richie win rate is very, very high. But we will get to that later. Other situations for Dama. You're in a score situation where winning is more important than value. Like, you're an all-last, or you're in a big first place. You just have, like, a Yaku, and you're okay with just winning your Pinfu Nomi or your Pinfu Dora 1, because winning the hand is more valuable than increasing your score from 2,000 to 3,900 or 7,700, if you get lucky with Uradora. Um, you're a Cheetoy, or you're Tonki, and you're trying to find a better weight. This does not mean you should pass Rome. If the tile happens to come out, then like guaranteed points is almost always better than no points, unless you are in a situation where you cannot, where winning does not help you, like you're in deep blast. But otherwise, you should definitely not pass. But I definitely have Dama and Cheetoys trying to just find a better way, because sometimes you can't really control what you end up on waiting for Cheetoy. A situational one that is definitely a bit more of a gray area, but if you are Tempai and there's another someone else is reaching, and you are Dama on their Genbutsu, that is definitely a situation to consider dama -ing. Though I also typically will still reach you if there is like a significant increase in value. Like, if my hand is only like 2,000, then I might just reach it anyway, because the upside of getting like Ura or like Ipatsu or Ura and going from 2,000 to 7,700 is just so big. It's all last, uh, another Dama, like, pretty much cut and dry Dama situation. All last, you have a Yagu, and you have enough points to accomplish whatever the heck you want to accomplish. Fairly straightforward. Like, you have enough points to get out of last, you have enough points to get first, to secure first place. You have enough points to, or you're not in a situation where you can really improve your standing, but you have Tempai to win the game. Or you have Tempai to confirm your third. Uh, another one to note, um, specifically relevant to New York especially, uh, I dama a lot when the pot is worth more than the Richi. So with the uh, with big homba, that can happen pretty quickly. You know, Pinfunomi with two homba isn't really worth reaching because the two homba is worth three k. But this, I mean, this will happen on ladder as well. Like you can very easily have a hand where there's you know two Richi, six two homba, and all of a sudden you've got twenty six hundred in the middle. It's not really. The increase in value from 1,000 to 2,000 for Pinfunomi doesn't really... Because you're not actually winning or increasing your value from 1,000 to 2,000. You're increasing your value from 3,600 to 4,600, which is, which is a significantly lower percent. So it's definitely worth dominating there just to collect the sticks more consistently. And then the, uh, the more complex one that I kind of just... This is just kind of me ballparking, like, and more of like a feeling thing, but it's something that I've found has worked for me to try to quantify it. If it's early enough in the game, like first row, uh, and you have like three times as many weight slash value upgrades, it does not mean you should skip sumo or furry ten reaching unless you have to. But the example I gave is you have two, three, four, five, seven pin, and that upgrades on one, three, four, and eight pin for like potential pinfu or rianmen. Uh, nine pin is also going to be a higher win rate. Two five pin is probably the shampoo is probably better than the six pin Kanchan. So that's one where I would generally wait for upgrades, but also just slamming it right away, especially if it's a little bit later and you're trying to slow down other players' hands, is very reasonable. When you have a Yaku as well, you can be a lot pickier about waiting for upgrades. But in general, if your upgrade is just a Kanchan, this is what the math is at the bottom. Uh, there's, say you have a Kanchan, like you have a four six mon. Uh, your only upgrade, your only like actual like upgrades, upgrades are three mon and seven mon because those are the ones that give you a two sided weight. 
So, so that is eight out of 136 tiles. It's approximately six percent to draw that per turn. That, on average, like just to be like a fifty percent chance of happening, will take eleven turns. So you might as well just reach it now. And even then, if that does happen, you only add one more tile of winning. Like half the time when you do get that upgrade, you're still just gonna win on the five mon that you would have won on anyway. All right. Just to clarify that something was... here for people who might not be familiar with some of the rules we play with in New York, the example where the homba are worth three thousand points are when you're playing with homba, big homba, where they're worth fifteen hundred points instead of three hundred points. Uh, so make sure you check the rules before you uh, make reach your Adama decisions based on points in the middle. Yeah, of course. Gotcha. This felt like a good place to just stop briefly for questions, if anyone had any, because this was a whole lot of text and not a lot of time. I don't see anyone typing in the threads, but that is all right. If, uh, if someone wants to go ahead and I will just come back to it, but otherwise we will just move on. Okay, Ricci versus Dama. Ricci, literally everything else. <laughs> like, kind of joking, but mostly not. Um, I yoinked these two charts from Statistical Mahjong Strategy, which is a book that has been translated to English. But essentially, you can just kind of go through this chart, and I won't like go through all of them. But, like, pretty much anything that's below Mongon, that, like, is below guaranteed Mongon, like, this top right is bad weight, and, like, bad to mediocre weight, aka, like, four tiles or less. Or, like, three to four tiles for a Kanchan. And this top, this chart, bottom left, is Rian men weight. Pretty much always, even, like... Even for 350 Fu and 340 Fu, for Rian Men, it's still better to Ricci, almost like for the expected value. Um, for Kanchan, 340 is much, much closer, which is why like you can consider dominating it. But pretty much everything below that is just Snap Ricci, unless you have an active reason not to, like we mentioned previously. And even here, and here's where like it's Dama 77, Ricci 5 Han. Ricci is a full 700 points higher EV on turn 5, and even 400 points higher EV on turn 8. Yeah, so I was slightly off on that, but by turn 12, you'd rather just Dama, because your win rate goes significantly down when you Ricci that late. And then, things that are higher than that, you typically just want a Dama. Uh, because the the more consistent points is worth a bit more than the up half ah, better shot at twelve thousand. Alrighty, going on from there. Okay, so this is my general thoughts on calling and how Can to. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. You got a question in the chat from Tomas saying, "Do you ever dama to maintain the option to four? Uh, da, 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 da. let me go back. Hmm. Do I ever Dama to maintain the option to fold? Um, yes, generally that will be in a situation where I think I touch on that a little bit later, though it definitely should have been put in here. I'll remember to go back and edit this. Um, dama with the to maintain the option to fold is very, very effective when there's someone showing a lot of value. And you're waiting on a potential, like a potential tile that would be discarded into them. Like someone's got a door upon and you're waiting on Genbutsu. Like that would be a Dama, I think, to me, especially if your hand is only like 1k. Okay. But otherwise, typically, like if I'm fighting, like I'm just going to keep fighting. So I might as well just get the most points out of it. This is. Unless, like. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, this is actually something that came up in the championship games that we streamed recently. Um, depending on the situation, say if you're playing in a tournament and you're up by a whole lot, you're less incentivized to make dangerous moves if you have an overwhelming lead. So in the second Hanchan, I think, when I got a Pinfu Dora 1 Ranman Tempai as dealer, which is normally an instant Ricci, I chose to Dama because I thought it was first a, a class C Rianmen, meaning it's waiting on two middle tiles, and then I also didn't need to win the Hanchan, I just didn't need to come in last place. So in certain 
very rare situations uh, you can consider not calling Richie in order to, you know, easily fold out, and then you just take the run if you want because it only helps you out. Yeah, and that's just, like, briefly touched on with the uh, your in-score situations where winning is more important than the increased value. You just give you give yourself that fold out because there's no reason to risk anything up 20k, uh, which is the general idea of higher win rate and options for safety is better than slightly increasing points when you don't need when you don't really need any more points. Um, I see Christian asking in the chat. Uh, so the prob- what I'm saying here with the uh, the probability of A, it's uh, A not occurring. It took so with eight tiles out of 136 total mahjong tiles and a set at six percent per turn, it takes 11 percent just to get like a 50 50 chance of upgrading a Conchon to a Rihanna, just to get one extra tile of waiting. So it's not particularly worth it to wait for that. Uh, I will definitely have to make that a bit more clear. Okay, anyway, going into opening judgment. Um, a big part of the judgment on opening hands is not we're not trying to get Tempai ASAP, or we're not exactly just trying to fill blocks in our hand as soon as possible. We are trying to get Tempai ASAP. However, getting Tempai ASAP does not mean that we call the first thing that we're given. Our win... And if we can call in a way that prioritizes getting us to a final two-sided shape, our win rate is going to be a lot higher and we're going to be a lot safer if we do get caught up with. Because even if someone does reach it, having a good weight is generally will generally help us win. Sorry, will generally help us win fights at a high enough rate that the risk is worth it. So typically, when I'm looking at an open hand, unless my hand is Mongon plus or all good shapes, I'm looking at identifying the bottleneck tiles for the hand, and those are the ones that I'm going to call first. Like, if my hand, say, is like 4-5 pin, 6-8 mon, and then like a bunch of other like random completed Tanya or random Tanya shapes, I'm going to want to chi the 6-8 mon shape before I chi the 3-6 pin shape. Because once you open once, and especially once you open twice, people are start going to stop giving you tiles. So those tile, those shapes that are a little bit harder to fill in naturally are going to become harder and harder because people are going to stop giving you tiles to call. And then you end up, and then oftentimes you'll end up on a Kanshan weight, someone reaches, and you're kind of regretting your life. So really it's just don't rush to open your hand on good shapes. Those shapes will fill in naturally, and those are the shapes that you want to end up waiting on. Identify the shapes that are not necessarily the easiest to fill in naturally. Like, if you're going for Tanya, like a 7-8, you want to start by cheating the 6, rather than cheating a shape that already guarantees a Rianman. Another thing when you're playing open, uh, Pawn is almost always going to be faster than Chi because once you're open again, like players will typically be at least somewhat concerned about yeah, the tiles they're dealing into you, but that's mostly just Kamicha. Uh, the other players, like, usually will just continue playing as normal, so you'll want to just try to find tiles that you can palm because then you'll be able to take tiles for everywhere and progress your hand. Pawning also oftentimes will block off and make a make the tiles around the palm significantly safer to cut if you do end up having to fight because you're using three of like let's say you have like a two four four pin shape if you palm the four pin the two pin is now one chance but yeah once you open the first time though just unless you uh unless you're just put into a situation to fold and just start calling everything uh, once once you take that first call we just need to be tempi as fast as possible because you've essentially set yourself a timer though you can also walk that back a little bit if you don't have a ton of value. Like, two, you really should not be calling three times for 1,000 points unless you are very competent in the speed or the 1,000 points is very meaningful. Alright. Uh, these are a lot of the times that I immediately am prioritizing opening. You have 2 plus Dora. You have 2 plus Dora. You want to win as often as possible. Winning 3,900 points is a lot better than trying to force uh, trying to force a closed hand that's full of like Kanchans and punk and random Shanpons and tiles that are very not that easy to fill in naturally. Uh, you can always also just like pull in the third door or draw an Akka and then boom, you have an open manga. 
Lord plays dealer turn. I'm usually trying to open if I can. Usually trying to open a lot more safely than maybe some of the more aggressive opening that I do some of the other times. Is skipping fourth foot skipping someone's dealer turn when they're below you goes a long way towards preventing their ability to get out of last place. Which for us is great because that means we don't lose points. Yeah. Uh, winning in the late game and you can proceed reasonably safety safely. Uh, this is something I'll get into a little bit later with the concept of like Sakagiri. But if you can win like 1k in South 2 from first place, you've essentially just cut away one third of the remaining game. And that is one third of the game that people are not making like Mangan hands to catch up with your first place. Uh, you have a Yako high pair or five early Tanya blocks. Um, you should pretty like. Even if your hand's not, like, great, you can still palm the early Akohai or, like, Chi and early Kanchan for Tanyao. Uh, and you can just aggressively hold safety. Because, again, a lot of the times, these hands are not going to complete naturally by themselves. So you just want to make the hand happen. Like, winning a 1,000 points is not necessarily... like it's, I mean, it's not fantastic, but it's better than someone else winning a manga, and even if you're not the one that deals into it. These are... Shutting down hands like that, especially in a tournament, is how you win these games. And then the last thing was there are expensive hands on the board. Like, if someone pulls the Chindora, that's not necessarily, like, insta-fold. Especially if you are waiting on tiles that they could possibly, like, that are reasonably safe to discard to them. You can just plant, start trying to cheat all those tiles and shut down their hand with, like, your Tanyao Aka or something like that. Or your Hatsudora one. Uh, but the thing is, you can always just make sure that you're holding enough safety that you can bail out. Until you get Tenpai. And then if you get Tempai, you just kind of put yourself into the fight. And if you draw a tile that you don't think will, if you draw a tile that you don't think will pass, you just can play around it, see what happens, or you can just push. That's the thing. It's like pretty much all of these, you can just you have to balance with your confidence to actually folding with less tiles in your hand. So for me personally, I play a very open game. I've also been playing a whole lot of East only games, which only rewards being able to play open games comfortably which I think is very good practice for it. But if you're not confident in folding once you've made two calls... Uh, sorry. Yeah, if you're not confident that you are that you can fold once you've made two calls, then you can take a much more Menzen approach to the game. Uh, Menzen being closed. Uh, being asked, what are your considerations for skipping the first Yakohai discard that you can fall? Um, a lot of the times, if I'm skipping the first Yakohai... I usually am either in a situation where I need points and my hand isn't really worth it if I do pawn it. Uh, I'm relatively close to Tenpai already, so I feel like I can reach on a Sean Pawn for the last honor and feel like it'll be a strong weight. Or the hand is just like so like unbelievably bad that it's just like not worth it. And even then, sometimes I just pawn it. I think uh, the Kobago book has a really good section on like calling the Akahai even though you have a trash hand. Alright. And then a quick uh, quick spot on K10, or just being Tenpai a draw. Uh, you should pretty much just open your hand for Tenpai in the third row. Uh, being Tenpai versus being not Tenpai a draw is very, very significant. And your win rate, if you get Tenpai with like three or four draws left, is not going to be that high anyway, even if you do get it closed. Uh, so you might as well just take the Tenpai and lock in your nice, uh, if you can get to exhaust, lock in your nice, like, 1,000 slash 1,500 slash 3,000 points. Because being the only one Tenpai is equivalent to winning a 3 hand, yeah, which is very, very significant. Yeah, so typically, by the time I reach the third row, I will take just about any, uh, any Tenpai call unless I, like, Unless the Ashantan is very wide, or I really, really need the points from a late Ricci and just hoping for the best. Even without a Yaku. All right. Um, okay. Now on to the concept of Sakigiri. Sakigiri, conceptually, you're just sacrificing efficiency to hold on to safe tiles. But like the timing of it and the execution of it per on a hand-by-hand -hand basis is incredibly difficult. And honestly, this is the slide that I had the toughest time writing because it is just not very easy to like quantify when or how or like which tiles you should be doing this with uh, so i just put down a bunch of general like concepts of do of when to and when to not sakagiri 
but you do have to remember that this is an offensive and defensive weapon at the same time. Um, you're sacrificing and what is to you an acceptable amount of speed with a hand, like, you know, four tiles of efficiency if you cut from like a four, five, five, eight, eight type uh, Ishan 10. You sacrifice four tiles now to be able to fight safely later. Maybe you think that you're not going to be the first one Tempi, or you just don't want the uh, the tiles that the Tempis that you get when you draw eight pin slash five bond because you lose out on like Pinfu and you're just getting Reach and Nomi at that point. But one thing on Sakagiri that's very, very easy to fall into, you have to be mindful about the tiles that you're holding as safety. A lot of the times, I will Sakagiri a tile, and then two turns later, I'll just cut my safe tile, which is like, okay, well, what was the point of this? I'd much rather just have the tile that was useful to me. Um, because I draw something that else that is complicated, that complicates my hand. Or I'll just default to like, oh, this East is probably safe, so I'll hold on to it. And then it gets to the, the turn Tenrichi that I was trying to fight against, and no one's cut an East yet, and I was half paying attention, and now I look at it, it's like, do I really want to cut the live east into this Ricci? No. So what was the point of me holding this this whole time? It's always make sure that you're mindfully thinking about the tiles that are safe. And if you do get the opportunity, you should switch out your safe tiles if they are equivalently safe, because that can mess up the reading of people, of, like, the way that people read your hands. Uh, we'll talk about it a bit later, but people like cutting safe tiles from their hands is a big indicator of potential tempi or dama or just being generally close. So you can kind of throw some people off if they're paying enough attention. All right. So top part of this is just when to ignore Sakagiri. Um, you've got Mangan Plus. Uh, just full send it. You've got Mangan Plus. Like you're almost always like justified in fighting. Uh, the only time you should really be cutting efficiency in favor of safety is if you're locking in value to do so. Like, 455, five, if you're in the 4 is the Dora, you're not really, like, considering those extra 5s or the extra pawn in another suit that much value, because then you're not really pushing manga and you're pushing... You have to cut the Dora, so you're most likely now pushing free Uh When you're planning on opening, um, you should... De pawning is faster than cheese, so don't give up pawn tiles for safety without good reason. This is also tying back to just always trying to end up on two sided weights. But when you are open or plan when you're planning on opening the hand, you should definitely just you can find safety after you open. Because the shapes will kind of start to fix themselves. In the first row, generally. Uh, you don't really need to Sakagiri, especially the first five turns. Like turn five, turn six is when it starts becoming pretty uh, normal. In which, unless your hand is, like, really, really bad. Uh, and if your hand is that bad, then, like, consider going for something a little bit more, like, off the wall. Like, a bit, like a super high roll Honitsu or something. Because, like, your hand's really bad anyway. So you might as well, like, try to progress towards an expensive hand while holding safety from the get-go. Um, in the third row. Because at that point, it's not Sak Sakagiri, it's just pushing. Uh, <laughs> if you're cutting tiles that are dangerous, that because you think they'll be dangerous later on in the third row, guess what? They're dangerous now. Uh, so you might as well see what tempi you get and not sacrifice efficiency because just give yourself give give yourself as many opportunities to be tempi as possible once you're that late rather than cutting a tile that you don't necessarily need to cut and then suddenly dealing it. Yeah, and then lastly, like when your shapes need the help, like you really should not be sakagiring tiles away from shapes that will not remain two sided. Like if you're cut, if you have like a six six eight mon, you really should not be sacking a a six mon and then ending up on a conchon. That's more in line like when you're planning on opening. But like the six six eight is not a shape that necessarily works super easily. So you want to keep the help around. Sakagiri is more for shapes along the lines of like three four four. You can cut the four. Oh, you still have the Rianmen, but you just leave yourself a little bit of safety, and you still just try to end up on the final Rianmen shape. And then times two Sakagiri. Uh, in the second row, like turn turn six to eight, really, more like turns five to nine. Uh, the average reach you turn for a lot of Mahjong is like between turn eight and nine. The average, there's at least one Ishanten at the table on average by like turn six, uh, turn six to seven. So if you get the sense that you're not going to be the first one to Tempai, then yeah, you can definitely do, like, make those make those decisions. Um, getting safe, like when you're the second Richie or the second Tempai, like 
having one less tile that you have to push actually say, like makes your EV so much higher. Like if you have safe entry, because then you have you have so much more flexibility. You know, you can choose to dama, you can choose to fold, and you but you have safe entry and you can even like catch a. You can get a lot more Ipatsu wins that way as well. Uh, when you're winning. When you're winning, naturally, uh, you don't have to be as efficient, and you can just try to hold safety. Uh, that's one of those things that robots yell at me a lot for, because I'm a coward. But... Yeah, just generally when you're winning, like you can play a whole lot safer, because you know you only lose if people sumo big hands, or you screw up. So minimizing the situations for your that you can deal into is going to just help your average placement once you're doing well. Yeah, considering, yeah, being asked about considering Honey 2 for terrible hands, I mean, when you open a hand that has, like, you know, seven unique types and five of them are honors and you have, like, no blocks or, like, maybe you have one block and one suit, like, you might as well just go Honey 2, right? Because the thought for me is that if you play this hand normally, like, at best you're getting, like, Richie Dora 1 or like Richie Pinfu. And even then, that's like what? Like a 5% chance or something? So if I'm going to play for a 5% chance, I might as well do something that's both like safe and that's not only like safer because you have all the like extra Yakuhai and wind tiles for the, for the Honinsu, but also has the potential to be much more expensive, like a Honinsu and the Dora suit. Is like you're not winning the hand unless you high roll anyway, so you might as well make the high roll like actually expensive. Plus, it get, it open up, eh, it can open up the opportunity for you to bluff. Um, people will generally, uh, people will generally over respect twenty two uh, up to a certain point. So if you make like a call or two while still maintaining a lot of safety, and it, you look twenty two, all of a sudden like someone might open a hand that they otherwise would have reached, and now their potential mangan is 2,000 points, and you just made your trash hand cost that person 6,000 points. All right, anyway. Other situations to hold on to more safe tiles in Sakagiri. Uh, when the extra efficiency would cost you Yaku or Senpais that you don't want. Like, if you have, like, if you're reaching, if you have, like, a 2-3-3, three, three, like, 8-8, eight, eight, like, that's, like, the default for me for Sakagiri. Uh, like, that type of shape where you have, like, the Rion men and a pair. Uh, if pairing, like, the 3-pin or, like, the 8-pin or getting an Anko would get you just, like, reaching Nomi, then just, you know, you don't really want it. So you might as well just toss it back. Uh, or just, like, hold the safe tile. Or, like, you're losing, like, Sanshoku, you're losing Dora, you're losing Akka. Like, those are all, like, situations where you definitely just want to cut the, that extra tile in favor of safety. Uh, when you're open and your shapes are all two-sided already... Uh, and your hand is cheap, especially when you have like cheap open hands. Like, you can hold two safe tiles and just like slowly, like slowly work them in. And then if you like draw like a pair into a conchon or something, like a six six eight, like you can cut one of your safe tiles, and you still have one more safe tile. And so you, is the goal, especially when you have a cheap open hand, is to end up on like Rianmen, Rianmen, Ishanten with a door pair, with like or sorry, not a door pair with a uh, with a safe tile. Because that is going to be the most consistent way of winning your cheap hand safely. Um, and then lastly, when someone else is threatening Honitsu slash Chinitsu early, like you see an early guest win poem, or you see like early middle tile cuts of another suit, like you want to pretty, especially if you're not their Kamicha, you want to really quickly, you, you want to really quickly get rid of like floating like random tiles in that suit, because if you don't get rid of them quickly, then they can just get stuck in your hand forever. And tiles outside of the suit of the Honitsu are going to be significantly easier to get because theoretically other players are going to be more willing to cut away from that suit as well. Gotcha. Again, this was like the most difficult slide to write for me. And I. So if anyone has specific questions on Sakagiri, honestly, a lot of the time it's just kind of situational and it's really just something you get a feel for by playing a lot. It's just like, hmm, okay, when is the right timing on this? And you just kind of develop your own, like, your own instinct for it that works. Anyway, push fold. Uh, we're not going to gonna go super in-depth here on push fold. It's more in-depth than this slide. Uh, but especially when you're just starting out, this was this chart from Rishi Book 1 
was pretty much the gospel for me when I was learning this game. And it's honestly very, very good, though it is, I mean, I will say it's outdated currently, and you can push a lot more than this thing says, uh, which we will talk about. But especially if you're like coming into this and you're still like in the process of learning or you don't necessarily know when to fold, this is a very, very good starting point of just push if you've got a good hand or a good weight or like you've got good like high points, your senpai or a good weight, two out of three, and then fold if you're not. The harder part then of following this is actually making yourself do it because pushing is a lot more fun than folding to most people. There's some people that enjoy folding. And honestly, like improving your improving the choices you make defensively is the fastest way to see yourself save points in the long term. Mm-hmm. Is at a certain point most people are playing their hands, at least like offensively, very, very very similarly. So you can create the most gap for yourself by like successfully finding the best defensive resources every turn. But the topic on push fold that I did want to talk about specifically is Suji counting. Push fold is very, very difficult. It's not necessarily like something that's even like super easy to quantify. So we attempted we attempted to do so and just did a bunch of math. So essentially there, and this is just calculating for Mahjong, like for Mahjong, a lot of defensive theory, like Suji, One Chance, Kabe, Sotogawa, which we'll talk about later. All of these things boil down to playing around two-sided weights. Um, two-sided weights being like, you know, you're wait- you have a 2-3 so and you're waiting on a 1-4 so. There are 18 total suji that are live in any given hand. There's 1-4, 2-5, 3-6, 4-7, 5-8, and 6-9 in each of the three suits. But what you can do is when someone declares Richi, you do a quick check of how many suji are live. Like, so how many, how many two-sided weights are still available that are not furry thin to that Richi? And that you can generally use to ballpark your dealing rate. And then you can do some like math on like the average value of a Rishi given how many Dora you see. And it's like, yeah, a lot of math, but eventually you just kind of ingrain it. But so here's an example. Um, again, if this image is not super clear, then feel free to just full screen it or I can post. Actually, I can't really post it, but someone else can if they want to. But the player across from me has declared Rishi. Uh, and we've got this nice dealer Shantan, but we, but we would have to cut this 8-pin if we wanted to fight to get Tenpai later. Right now we have this Hatsu that's like usually okay, though not guaranteed to be okay. We do only see one of them besides the one that we have. But for now we're thinking mostly about this 8-pin. So if we're counting if we're counting the Suji from this Ruchi in order, okay, the nine pin die the six nine pin line is dead, the one four mon line is dead, the two five pin line is dead, the two five so line is dead. The 5 8 mon line is dead. The 5 8 so line is dead. And also the 2 5 so, but that was previously killed. The 4 7 so line is dead. The 3 6 pin line is dead. And the 6 9 mon line is dead. So if we math all that out, that is 8 of the 18 suji, which means that if we deal, if we push this 8 pin 10% of the time and they have a two sided weight, we will deal in 10% of the time. Which with this, with this Ishanten is very, very reasonable. Your dealer, you have Pinfudora, Wani, Shanten. Um, our weight doesn't look terrible either way. The three pin is safe to the original Richie, and the 360 does not look like tiles that they necessarily need. And the biggest thing, honestly, that Suji counting helps you realizing, but the biggest thing that you realize with uh, Suji counting is that no individual tile really has that high of a deal in rate, unless like you get into rare situations. Like this is, we're into row three, right? And there's only eight of the 18 Suji dead even with this player pushing. So, like, this is definitely, like, a pretty reasonable push to make. The problem comes when you start stacking these Suji, but we'll get into that. Then the next step with Suji counting with this is to start incorporating other concepts like Kabe, Sotogawa, etc., etc. So, like, consider here, like, we see all of the 2 so. So, like, by that, by default, we can also discount the one four so uh, line, even though that's not actually dead. Oh, it was 2-5 pin not listed. Whoops. Okay. Well, 9's Suji. Whatever. Okay. It throws off the math a little bit, but we'll uh we'll get back to that. I apologize. I will go off the math that I've written down because I am again not perfect at this, but again, this is more about ballparking things. Because this is like once you're a bit 
practice at this, like you can see some Arishi this and just do a quick out in your head. Um, if you're very practiced at it, you can keep track of it while it's happening, but that is not something that I can do. It's generally fairly difficult, or most of the time, if a tile deals in, you are getting fairly unsafe. It's just whether or not it's the risk. But anyway, if we do, but yeah, but then if we consider that one four so is also very unlikely to, or that one four so is dead because we see all the two so, and that one four pin is very unlikely to deal in because they like cut two pin way back here. That means that that's all of a sudden that's now eleven of the eighteen two G that's dead, and we're up to, we're up to seven tiles left, like seven lines left I could deal in, which even then. Um, if we assume we're always dealing into a manga, which is not going to be the case, especially with, uh, we see how many of the Dora? We see three, which means that there's four Dora still left live. Um, so if we assume we're always dealing into a manga, uh, dealing in one seventh of the time is about 15%, which is, if you multiply that by 8,000, it's just going to be just over 1,000, which is pretty much the amount of points that you would lose for being a pretty much the amount of points that you would lose for being no 10. So it's definitely worth pushing this if we do get 10 by later down the line. But for right now, we definitely will just cut the comparatively safer green dragon. Or we can just decide to fold out with 9 pin, 9 pin. But from this hand, I feel like it was definitely something that's reasonable to just continue fighting for. I see a couple of questions coming up in the chat here that I just want to A couple questions that are coming up in the chat here that I just want to briefly uh, touch on. Like, if someone's threatening Honisu slash Chinitsu, uh, if you're their Kamicha, you can consider choking their hand uh, and just saying, okay, I'm not going to let you win your big expensive hand, and if I fail in tiles around those, great. If you're their Shimosha or Toyment, especially if you're cutting, like, general, like, middle floating tiles, if they pawn them, that significantly limits the options that they have to actually, like, create their hand. So it's actually not all that bad if they do progress their hand, and it gives you significantly more opportunity to fight them. Okay, but next slide on this though, with Suji tracking. So like the eight pin here is like fairly pushable because that's only it's only one tile. But if you add like another tile to this, so I'm doing the math on this as like eight pins one eighth of dealing because I miscounted. So it's let me just double check real fast. It's it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Or maybe even it's ten. No, yeah, no, it's nine. Yeah. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, yeah. So it's nine total types. I just mistyped one for some reason. I I um so like I, yep. I think it is 10, though. If a Suji is implied dead because of a cub, it counts as one of the Sujis being out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah, it's like we're cutting it, but like we're considering the Kabe, we're also considering the Sotogawa. So we're calling this like, we're calling this like 11 or 12 dead now because of that. So all of a sudden we're at like, you know, one seventh to deal in, one sixth to deal in. If you combine those two chances, like that's over 25% if you have to cut two tiles. So we really should only be taking these fights like this from Ishanten when we are only planning on cutting one tile. Um, and you can just kind of like, you and you can assess each turn whether or not you want to risk the uh, the ever lowering Suji count. But again, for right now with this hand, like you can just play the relatively safe Hatsu if you do want to fight. Uh, from this score situation this early in the game, it's felt like a pretty natural fight. Uh, if this was like South 3 and this happens, then I might just say I'm happy just like playing 9 pin, 9 pin and taking my confirm and trying to get out of third place in all west but when you look at you know the combined dealing rate of like 25 percent for just two tiles uh and you realize that most intermediate plus mahjong players are sitting at 10 to 14 percent dealing depending on their play style and experience like that is obviously significantly higher so you want to avoid the situations where you can but like that 10 to 14 percent you know pushing the one suji or even pushing a couple suji if the suji counts lower like that's perfectly fine Okay. Anyway. Huh. Okay, on to the next thing, which is Mawashi. Uh, Mawashi is just generally playing around Arichi, uh, with just varying defensive concepts. Like, oh, like this is one chance, so it has a low percent dealing rate. Or it's like, oh, this is Sadagawa, this is Kabe. It's like all these things that are like 
not or this is like one cut honor all these things that are like not guaranteed to be safe but like are generally pretty safe uh it's a very addicting thing <laughs> it's it's very very easy to do just because you feel like you can i typically call them ego pushes so you have to like make sure that you have a purpose in mind that you're actually like cutting these because you think you can win the hand or you think you can end up tempi or you think that they are just the safest tile in your hand in general Because you do have to remember, like, these are, like, you are pushing. You have to, uh, you have to remember, like, just because the dealing rate isn't, like, is low does not mean it's not zero, and sometimes you will just be wrong about the thing that you think about. Yeah. But anyway, this is just, so this is just a section on, specifically, it's about Sadagawa, which is a concept that I think is underexplored in English. Which, yeah, it's a bit underexplored in English, and I just kind of want to introduce it to people and its use cases, because honestly, some realizations around Sotogawa was a big part of why I suddenly found myself, like, climbing rather than stagnating. Okay, so Sotogawa essentially, conceptually, is playing behind uh, early, like, 2, 3, 7, 8, even sometimes, like, 4, 6 discards. Uh, like, if someone cuts on turn 2 or 3, like a 3 so. You know, pretty often, unless they have an incredibly fast hand, uh, they do not have anything in that area. So, comparative to other, like, live tiles later on down the road, like, the 1 and 2 so are going to be quite safe. But when you can combine it with half Suji, then you can kind of create a lot more safety than a tile might inherently have. And it's a big part of how I, like, find myself you know, fighting in hands that I would have previously given up on. Yeah, so take the picture of this Rigi. Um, this was actually, I felt like a quite nice example. Uh, you can kind of see the hand progression from the way that my Shimacha here discarded their tiles. Uh, they cut, so they started with three pin and then seven so. So like, initial, I mean, they cut like some useless honors, of course, beforehand, but they started with three pin and then seven so. And then played the comparatively further outside 8-pin and 2-so. So you can kind of reasonably assume that, like, the 3-pin was floating by itself, as was, like, the 7-so, or the 7-so was just, like, part of a block that already finished. Whereas, like, the 8-pin and the 2-so were part of blocks that either were still waiting to be completed, or the 8-pin was greeting around the Dora, and the 2-so was part of the final shape to get to Tempai. Which does not mean that the final weight is around the two so. Like they very easily could have just filled in. They very easily could have just filled in, um, like that shape. Like if they had like a two two three, they very easily could have drawn like a one or a four so, and their weight could be completely unrelated. So even though like so with Sodagawa, like with this Haku draw, even though we passed this Hatsupon, we could push this hand if we really wanted to. Banking on like nine so being relatively safe because they cut seven so before eight pin and two so and two and two pin being relatively safe because three pin was cut prior to like all of these tiles. Yeah, but the third tile that we can really look at here and the general concept here that I think is quite important to look for is the four pin because now that the seven pin has come out post Ricci, well, we already kind of guessed from. We already kind of guessed from the so using Sotogawa previously that this one pin would pass. So if we think that one pin will pass and the seven pin is already passed, we can also then conclude that we think the four pin will pass, which is like that next step thought that is not necessarily inherently obvious, but like is will very commonly work. And in fact, the four pin oftentimes is even safer than the one pin here because the one pin is a better like Shanpon tile to wait on here than than like a three five pin shape that probably would have kept a three pin to try to work it with. Yeah. This concept and like all of the like again, like all of these things are built around Rianman. So like we know the four seven pin's impossible. We feel that one pin's safe. Essentially we think that the four pin is fine. Uh, well, we also feel similarly about the two pin of the nine so but and this is sometimes gonna happen. Like sometimes you'll cut these tiles and you'll still deal in. Uh, whenever that happens, especially when I was still like kind of learning this concept or like incorporating it, I would just like make a note and just just go back to the game, see like what happened with the hand. Like, did they make an efficiency mistake? They like purposely cut a tile early to try to set up like that specific trap in case they ended up getting tempi on that shape. Um, was it just a weird shape? And you can just try to think about like later on down the line. 
because like even with like all this thinking about like oh i can probably cut two pin i can probably cut four pin i can probably cut nine so what i did was just cut hatsu hatsu because there's no point you know like even if we do to something this is like kind of what i mean when i was going back to uh ego push i was just like do we think we probably can cut two four nine so yeah like what is the point of us cutting two four nine so what, what does this accomplish you know are we ever willing to cut seven nine mom what is our hand just going to be hakuhatsu and we're just going to risk a bunch of tiles into first place for ichi well or we're not that uh well our hand is not particularly extensive yeah, so, like, there's not really much point. So, like, you have to remember, just, like, these are concepts that, like, are useful and can help you find defensive resources in situations that you don't necessarily have them or let you move forward in situations that you would have previously just hard-folded. But there's not, like, you have to keep in mind that there has to be a point to actually, like, moving forward. Like, this hand isn't really worth pushing, so I push it. All right. Um, different, like, concept, just to kind of talk about a, a quick, hit, quick hitter here. Uh, setting yourself up to Gyak 10 over multiple hands. It's a bit of a change in pace, but essentially it's just, like, if you're, if you find yourself, you know, like, 12,000 points down in self 2, it doesn't mean we need to aim for a Hanuman every single hand. Uh, I pretty much set up, set up the goal of, by the end of the game, by all last, I want to be within Mangan Sumo range of whatever the next thing up is. And if I'm first place, I want to be out of Mangan Sumo range because Mangan Sumo is like the by far the most consistent like big hand value that you can aim for, because you can just get it with like like Richi Dora Sumo Ura and boom, you've got a Mangan and now you've overtaken someone, which is easy to aim for even with a bad hand, or like Richi Sumo Tanya Dora or Richi Sumo Hatsu Dora, like Richi Sumo Ura like can add makes Mangan very very well, yeah, Mangan Sumo very very consistent to aim for if you do find yourself in the in that situation. So essentially, what I'm saying is just like in South Two, South Three, especially like when like don't sell out for like a ten percent or like a five percent Hanuman when you can just win thirty nine hundred points consistently and make your all last situation a lot easier. Is rather than aim for a Hanuman every single hand, if we like slow even late in the game, if we chip away at a lead, we can find ourselves in situations where things are a lot a lot easier for us. And just remember that Mangan Sumo is ten thousand points to non dealer and twelve thousand points to dealer, which is an important math and something that Steve and I covered in our previous lecture on building value out of nothing. feel like I've gone a bit. Uh, does anyone have specific questions on where we are at? I'm going to be honest, I don't really remember how much of this is left. <laughs> I, I have preempted this. <laughs> I think if you're, I think you've been playing the same hand for four hours, you might be disconnected. All right. Anyway, uh, general defense. Uh, we've all kind of fallen. We've all like dealt into Suji and been like, "Oh, Suji's fake. I hate this." But like, it is important to think about like the types of like good Suji and bad Suji, and thinking about the types of state that you can deal into when you're cutting Suji. Like, for example, if you're cutting Suji to a 5, you can still feed a 1-3 Kanchan or a 7-9 Kanchan. And that might even happen fairly often because, like, those are fairly possible trap weights. Uh, you can also feed Tonkis and Chanfalls. So you should definitely, like, you should always be counting the tiles, like, around the potential Suji that you're cutting. Like, Kanchans and Kanchans can still be one chance. Chanfalls can also still be one chance. Oh, I must have missed that question, but yeah, I mean, you can really only do so much. Uh, if someone like if someone consistently has fast hands or Yako high pairs, like you can only do so much. You know, sometimes the game will be that way. But opening, like speeding up your own, if you need the value, then you're kind of like susceptible to what the game does and what the game feeds you. But like, all it takes is just like one. Like, if someone wins two K three hands in a row, and you sumo a mangan, guess who's winning? You know, so all, all it takes is one hand. Mm 
Though, but like at the same time, being that person that does open like that and speeds up a table can then bring other people into your speed and speeding up the table. And that means like people that should be winning Mungons might start winning like 2k or 3900 because they feel pressured by the speed that you're that you're forcing them to. Yeah, essentially, this slide is just think about the types of tiles, uh, think about the types of shapes that you can deal in before you just cut Suji because it's Suji. Um, if you don't see any of the one three so and you cut a two so and you feed a one three so Kanchan, like it's not like it was safe because it was Suji. You just cut Suji because, like, oh, Suji, I know that Suji's safe. Uh, but I mean, sometimes you'll cut the luckiest hand or the safest tile in your hand and you'll just and you'll deal it and like it happens. It's like again, no tile besides Genbutsu has a zero percent dealing rate, and even like Genbutsu is not a hundred percent, which we'll talk about later because the game's not a one v one just because someone de declares Suji. But making the correct choice on defense every single turn uh, when you are defending is what lets people have these 10 to 11% dealing rates as opposed to like the 14, 15% that kind of sprinkles, or thir like 13 to 15% that sprinkles itself through um, like intermediate play. And I mean, I'll even like say, like, I think my dealing rate in Ho right now is like 12.8 or something, which is higher than I'd like to be. It's like, it's, it's very, very difficult to like shave off that last like percent or two. Anyway, Rishi defense. Like I just said, the game does not suddenly become 1v1 when someone declares Rishi. The first thing that you should check besides just like confirming, okay, like what do I have to defend versus Rishi? And am I going to defend versus Rishi or am I going to just fight? Is look at the other players. Um, especially if they have to make decisions before you do. Like, are they pushing? Because if they're pushing, then you, you need to discard in an order that prepares you to defend versus the second Rishi. So if you have tiles that are, when you have tiles that are only safe to the Ricci, you should prioritize cutting them first, as opposed to tiles that are going to be safer to like a second Ricci or a tile that just came out from another player. If meanwhile, whereas if everyone's folding, then you can still kind of think about it, but it just it lets you you know think a little bit more about okay, can this hand still find Tempai somehow? How, what would I have to risk to get Tempai? So just assess whether or not other people are pushing. And even if uh, if someone looks like they're pushing, you can even feed them a couple of tiles, see if you can encourage them to call. And sometimes get caught with the Dama because this game sucks sometimes. Because if you can encourage someone else to fight, that means you are not you are losing points significantly less often. And because when two people are fighting, that means the sumo rate goes down. If you are defending properly and set yourself up to defend versus the second player. Okay, so yeah. So like very, very brief example, like and not exactly the best example here. Um, but just like if we have the choice here between cutting, like we have the 100% safe east. We have this player on our right that is pushing but is open for Tanyao and we don't exactly have anything safe there that we do see all four of the four so. So we could maybe cut the two, three so, but it's not guaranteed to be safe. But what we do have is three tiles that should pretty much always be safe to this player and this player in 9-mon, nine 9-pin, nine and East. The East is always going to be safe to everyone, but if we have to make a choice here, we should play the 9-pin first instead of the 9-mon. Because both of these tiles only deal into Hellweight Ricci, or Hellweight Tonki, that was not trapped prior to this Ricci, which seems like a very strange Ricci to take here. Um, surely they would, take, they would take a second to try to get a better weight than a Hellweight Tonki that isn't trapped. But we saw that we see that our Kami shot two turns ago, even though they played the five pin, they did push this nine so, which means they could be Ishanten and preparing to Ricci. And we would much rather have the nine mon in hand if they Ricci than this nine pin that looks potentially different, that looks potentially safe or dangerous. Sean Pond doesn't work for either, just as a note, because we see three of the nine mon and three of the nine pin. Uh. Yeah, so just like identify that okay, this player might be pushing, or they might just be like cutting tiles that aren't safe for some reason or other, and just prepare to also have safe tiles versus them if a second Ricci comes in. And then last thing with Ricci defense is especially when you know that a tile is safe, like it just came out that turn, or you suspect that a player is fighting but is not Tempai, folding with folding with tiles that are callable from an open player can significant can pretty much 
give you an out without you having to take any risk yourself. Uh, if you can get someone to call, then you can kill Ipatsus without taking any risk yourself by slimming down your hand. You can bait someone into fighting or dealing in for you. And again, like like I said, when two people are playing or trying to play offense on a hand, the sumo rate goes down because there are just significantly more runnable discards. Whereas opposed to three players folding, then if it goes to exhaust, then you lose points because you're most likely not tempai. And if they sumo, you lose points because they sumo. So if you can if you can cut tiles that you think someone can call and they call and you bait them into dealing in, or you bait the Ricci into dealing in to the open player, like congrats, you've saved yourself some points. It's a little bit niche, and you have to like engage it a little bit. Is like, okay, do I think this open player is tempai? Like, do I have any tiles that are actually like safe to this Ricci and like are useful? You know, it's a very niche case, but it's just something to think about. Okay, and then the other last thing is look for Dama signs, uh, Ricci defense, and I shamelessly ripped this from being asked this in Jen's Discord. So thank you to Jen, uh, and shout outs to her, as well as uh, Takizawa's Twitter, which is even more shamelessly ripping off. Uh, but we see here from the situation, um, it's East 3, and these are the scores. Like, we're at 11,000, the, the Ricci is at 8,300, and this player hasn't done much of anything but 25-6, but first place is at 54-1. Uh, we should be looking for, like, we can look for Dama signs here, because even though last place Ricci, first place played the non Gembutsu 8-pin, which, like, granted, 8-pin doesn't look like the most, like, risky tile in the world, but it's still not Genbutsu, and at a professional level, folding is usually just Genbutsu. Um, and it, it's Genbutsu, and then you just create more and more Genbutsu, or you like find the safest house, and maybe 8-pin comes out a little bit later. But become this, because this 8-pin came out on the Ipatsu turn, like that should be an alarm sign that maybe this dealer is not giving up on the sand, and maybe they have something. So Takizawa here, like, cut the two pin you can see here, and fed this like nice, this pretty, very pretty hand on the Gambitsu two pin, uh, with Tan pin Ipeko Dora two, which like you know what can you do? But he's ar he argued in his own tweet that he should have seen this and cut Chun Chun. Um, full disclaimer: I also was like asked this question and immediately cut two pin and was wondering why I was asking it because I didn't like pay attention closely enough to what was going on. But, like, the 54,000-point dealer risking something on the Ipatsu turn in a game where you trust your opponents to be making sound decisions, it should be a red flag. So if someone's making pushes that you're not necessarily, like... Or if someone's, like, cutting non-safe tiles into a Ricci, then that should be the start of you thinking, like, okay, maybe they have a Dama on a Genbutsu. But sometimes the Genbutsu is the safest tile anyway. Like, you shouldn't be folding to Dama Ghosts just... Like, you, sh or you shouldn't be dealing into a Ricci just to avoid, like, a potential Dama on Genbutsu. So, but in this case, he happened to have the option of playing Chun Chun and avoiding that s potential situation for at least a few turns, which maybe causes him to fold or maybe causes him to push a few more tiles, which makes it much more obvious that the two pin is something to be wary about. Yes, yellow is Sumagiri in this case. Yeah, very like rare situation and not really something to think too much about. But it is just something to just kind of note, like, hmm, why is the person in big first not folding this Ricci? They may be Dama. And that's just like one of the uh one of the Dama things that we'll talk about, because we do have a brief section on identifying Dama as well, which is right here. Uh, which I am very bad at, and I will be completely upfront about that. I suck at identifying Dama and generally think I would rather feed Damas than fold to ghosts. But you can, there are a few signs that you can look for that I'm still just very bad at seeing. Um, just being in the third row in general, if you're cutting middle tiles, just be prepared to feed a Dama. Think about, like, what what shapes you could be dealing into and whether or not, like, whether or not your hand is worth fighting for. Uh, also identify, like, where are the Dora? Do you see them? Does anyone see them? Are they usable in a hand that could potentially be Dama? Um, a safe tile being cut from hand. This kind of goes back to what I was saying about swapping out your safe tile when you have the opportunity to. But if someone's cutting a safe tile from their hand, that means their hand is probably ready to go, or they have a tile that they don't want to cut. Um, so you should definitely consider cutting a safe tile to be at least a warning sign that the player is Ishan 10 or better. Uh, because why are they cutting the safe tile now rather than later? Um, and then players pushing tiles versus open value. This is something we talked about later. 
Yeah, this was something we talked about a little bit earlier. But like, if players are, if someone's pushing tiles versus like an open value, like an open like Chundor three column or something like that, uh, if they're not folding, then they could be Dama for a cheap or like, or if they're pushing tiles that are like not necessarily safe, but maybe not in the riskiest things in the world, or taking like, or you know, taking a while and then cutting a three so Dama or something when it's not safe at all and not reaching then a lot of times they could be Dama for like Pinfu Nomi or Pinfu Dora 1. And it honestly could be in your best interest to feed them, to shut down the uh, the Dora Mon- the Dora Pwned Manga, depending on the score situation of the game. But those are just a few situations where players could be Dama, which are worth like taking note of. Um, the big one for me is just like keeping an eye on when safe tiles come out, uh, because that is typically a pretty good indicator. Uh, this hand is at least Ishanten, and you should at least... If you're not planning to fight, you should be at least start preparing to defend for them with your discards. If not, defending to them already because you think they may be Dama. Okay. Open defense. I believe we are almost done. Um, these should be just the last few slides here. Uh, the first thing when to consider when defending versus an open hand is how much do you actually care? <laughs> like, because especially when you're playing without red fives, like open hands, it's pretty hard to have value unless it's like a Chinitsu or they have like a Dora poem. And even when you are playing with red fives, if you have two of the red fives or the and the door is not like a Tanya, like how much do we think? But it's worth just always consider. It's worth always considering like people don't open for like two, three call, like for 1k, like that often, you know? So think about okay, like what they could what could they have? Like where are the Dora? Could they have Dora pair behind? Like, I think this is a Tanya, but is it guaranteed to be a Tanya? Like are do I only see one of or zero of the Chun? Could they have a Chun Anko and be waiting like Dora Shan Palm or something like that? Always something to think about, but just like you have to decide for yourself like pretty quickly, like whether or not the open hand is actually something worth worrying about. Because paying 1k is Yeah, it's like paying 1k is cheaper than being no 10 most of the time. So you can just kind of like accept it and move on, unless you're in a situation where the score line is very, very tight. And even then, like, you still probably need to fight a little bit. Okay. This is a big ball of text, but this, the biggest thing that you're looking for when you are trying to defend versus an open hand is the last Tadashi they made. And a bunch of cases where this can be the case, and it's not the case. Uh, the general rule of thumb that people have given, which I don't necessarily agree with, but just putting it here, is that, like, this is Spec Tempai after three calls or two calls in the second row or one call in the last row. But really to me, it's like I'd rather just pay attention to anyone who's made two calls or anyone who's open by turn eight. Because like by turn eight, and even earlier, honestly, at least one player is usually Ishanten, or at least one player is usually Ishanten. And if they've made a call, then it's possible that they're better. So we might as well pay attention to their hand. Another big sign, a big sign that an open player is Tempai is like similar to Dama defense. If a safe tile or a tile that like clearly is not useful for their hand comes out, like if they're holding a nine so and they're pretty clearly open Tanya, and that nine so was safe to two players, like oh that was probably their safe tile. They're probably cutting it because they're Tempai. When that tile comes out, it's the Tadashi before that is very very often related to their weight. Uh, like a lot of times you'll have if you have like a four five five or something like we talked about with Sakagiri, you'll cut that five in favor of holding a safe tile, especially uh if the four is the door or something, or if you have like a three four four, you'll cut it because you don't necessarily or like a four four five and you have the Akka, you don't really want to cut. Yeah. So you should like say the last Adashi is that four, you should be worried you should be worried about three, you should be worried about six, you should be worried about two, you should be worried about five. All of those tiles in that range of the t- the shape, but it's, but catching that like that safety tile is why we should be paying attention to their hand prior to thinking about their tempi and like more around like the average tempi turn, so we can then have a chance of remembering what what the last Tadashi was before the safe tile because that's the one that's going to be the key like at least half the time is you know if you have two t- if you have two blocks like half the time. You're feeling one of them to Tempai, and half the time that'll be the one related to the tie you just cut. So it's not guaranteed, of course, that their weight is around their last Tadashi, but it is something that happens fairly often. Um, one thing to note, though, if a player you thought was already Tempai, maybe they cut a safe tile, or maybe it's just late in the hand, and they Tadashi a five, 
just consider like a lot of times that's them swapping out the other uh, for the red five, and that's not really a real Tadashi. And you can you still want to keep in mind the one that they previously Tadashi as well. Uh, one note as well: when an open hand cuts a pair back to back, it's fairly unlikely that they're actually Tempai after they cut the pair because they would have to get to Ishanten that has like get to an Ishanten that has a pair cut cut the pair, and then draw the ten draw their tile to Tempai on the exact turn that they cut the second tile of the pair, but the very next Tadashi should be the one that sets off the alarm bells, that they're almost always Tempai. Because, um, like, in what there are very few hands that aren't Ishantan that are going to be cutting a pair if they're open. Uh, but, if there are a few Sumogiris between that pair cut, or there's a call between that pair cut, they should almost always be Tempai. And then last thing, especially with open defense, like once a player opens, you play. You should pay attention to the tiles that come out from the Kamicha afterward. Because um, tiles that come out from the Kamicha, like, they would most likely call if they could. And if they don't call them, uh, that means oftentimes they're safe. They're not going to gu guarantee to be safe. You know, they could have like a floating six, they drew a seven, they couldn't call the eight mon beforehand, but then when you cut it, they run you and you pay 8k and you feel sad. But it's again just like one extra defensive resource to find to find like safety in a situation where you might otherwise have none. It's just like, oh, they could have called these tiles and they chose and if they had the shape at the time they chose not to, so I will also cut these tiles in the hopes that they just do not need tiles around that shape. But we should remember that this is only tiles after that they've opened because of our thoughts on opening beforehand. Like players should generally be opening with their bad shapes first. So if they had a good shape with it, they sh yeah if they had a good shape with it then it's possible that it's still in the hand because they and they didn't want to call the good shape just as their first open okay yeah definitely getting into the end here uh when the karagiri uh karagiri is essentially just like you 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 have a four five six so in your hand you draw five so you cut the five so from your hand instead of the five so from your draw uh, you do this because uh, you essentially do this when you're open because you expect people to be tracking that last Tadashi and you can throw them off the scent uh, sometimes of where your weight is around. Uh, you should definitely not do this if you are doing it near where your weight already is, but you should do it if it is away from your weight. Um, when you're closed, you should, I mean, really, you should, probably just shouldn't do it that often unless you're Dama and you're just breaking a Sumagiri streak, but honestly, doing it when you're closed, like, I... Eh, I don't know. I don't. I don't think you really very very rarely do you need to actually do it when you're closed. Uh, but when you're tempai, if you're cutting a gembutsu to a richi, you should usually be karagiring it because if you're trying to snipe a richi, that can look like you're folding. Especially if you like pause or do a little bit of like hemming and hawing about it, like you're choosing whether or not you want to push or fold. It's a little bit of gamesmanship, but like you know, the timer is a resource that we can use, especially online. Uh, very, very big in all caps here. Do not Karagiri if you do know not if you do not know what information you're conveying. Because most of the time you'll just be better off playing it straightforward. Okay. And then our last section here is just basic wall reading. Uh basic wall reading really is a combination of like kind of all the other things, but specifically Sodagawa. I will note. Kirinji, the manga, is actually really, really good for this. Uh, there are a couple arcs that go like fairly in depth in terms of like hand analysis and like reading the wall based on like what other players have discarded. And it is written in con in consultation with Shibakawa, who is currently one of the top performers in M League and is very, very good. Uh, highly recommend reading a couple of those arcs. Uh, and I have accidentally closed out of this, so give me one second. <laughs> Hooray. My uh, my melodic fell onto my escape key. All right, but yeah, while reading at a score is essentially just looking at your opponent's discarding. It's like, does it make sense for them to have this tile in their hand? This devil borrows heavily from the previous of uh, yeah, discussed concept of Sotogawa. Like if we look, like I look at the uh, so this hand from earlier uh, that we had with this Richie that I decided to fold to, but we discussed potential Sotogawa tiles. Like, we can kind of, like, follow the process of Shimacha's hand here. Of, like, they cut the three pin first, so it's pretty unlikely that they have anything in lower pinzu. Um, and then they cut the seven so, which, so it's pretty unlikely that they have anything in upper sozu. But, like, they ha then they cut the eight pin, which is near the Dora. 
So we can think either they were greeting near the Dora or they have or they have found a shape for the Dora. And most shapes that would use the Dora would either be seven eight nine pin, six seven eight pin, uh, but those don't really need an extra eight pin. So maybe a lot of times this is a Dora pair. Or they just happen to have like a seven eight eight nine or something, and we're just trying to dream of drawing another Dora and having two blocks around it. Either way, tiles around the Dora fairly likely to be in their hand, or they were just greeting it, and they didn't hit. But either, but they still cut this after three pin and seven so, so it's something to make note of. And then two so comes out last, even after the Dora agreed. So either they found something around the Dora, or the two so was very relevant to their Ishanten. Um, so by doing this, we can think like, okay, like. So just by looking at this player's discards, we think that like lower mo- Pinzu is pretty available, upper upper Pinzu may be available, but probably not. And the Dora probably not available, uh, upper Sozu probably not available. But then we have to and lower Sozu they probably have at least some of them, if not like a ton, at least like you know a couple a couple tiles there. And then we can kind of like extend that to the rest of the board. It's like okay, we see three nine pin here, so it doesn't really matter on like an upper Pinzu. Uh, we also, this player only cut 7 so after they were forced to by the Rishi, so they can potentially have like a 7 8 9 so in hand, and they were just folding from that. Uh, and But we also are like completely missing lower Sozu, and we're completely missing Manzu like almost entirely. So Manzu are like pretty likely, pretty evenly strewn about here. Um, upper Sozu like maybe achievable, but are fairly likely to be somewhere in these hands, since we don't think they're here and we don't have them. And again, Manzu would just like, we should ver- think very, very cautiously before deciding to play any Manzu. Oh. And then if we show this with open hands, we can see that we're like, we're pretty right. You know, like, there's the Dora pair that they did happen to have that was more like they might sometimes have it than anything consistent. Um, there is Upper Sozu in this hand. This hand just happened to have a floating 7 so that maybe they drew a 4 so afterward, um, but they were able to cut it without having Upper Sozu. Uh, but Lower Pinzu are like generally available, which we like kind of anticipated off of this. So that's like generally like very, very baseline wall reading in a nutshell. Um, but one thing, one last thing to think about is that if these players were to continue folding like this, like we've only seen Genbutsu cuts, like the Potsu turn has come, we've seen 7-so, we've seen 2-so, we've seen 2-so. Um, so we're thinking, so if we're thinking about this, then like if, the th- if we go this whole time and we like start making progress with this hand, the three pin is actually a pretty strong weight if it doesn't come out because we can anticipate that because the three pin has not been folded with that these players don't have it and it doesn't make much sense for this player to have it so we can anticipate that three pin would actually be a pretty good weight if we do end up on it and also because three pins a good tile so t- when players are folding tiles that don't get folded with very often could just be available to you in the wall Okay. Okay. And then this is okay. So that was the last section about Mahjong. And this is like more of like the, the kind of we improve on, like how to improve on your own here. So improve on your own to me is a bit of a misnomer because if you're trying to improve on your own, you're just making things a whole lot harder for yourself. Um, it's definitely possible, but like there's so there are a lot of resources that you can make is just turn it into like a community or social effort. Like New York has the, uh, the Mahjong advice channel. I post things, especially when I'm bored at work. It's just like, hey, like, this is, I had this hand. What do you think about it? This was my process. This was my thought processes here. Maybe you think something different. Um, especially if you're like starting on there, like, don't be afraid to disagree with like someone's common opinion. Um, especially if it's like wrong, quote unquote. Like, you'll get people telling you, it's like, oh, like, this is why, like, this is why we should or should not do this. Um, and it's like, it's not less that you're wrong, but more of like, this is just the level of modular knowledge that you currently have. Um, from a posting point of view, like something that I do very consistently is I just keep a notepad open, whether like next to my desk or like on my computer. It's just like if I run into situations that I want to remember to go back to, I write it down because otherwise I won't do it because I will forget and I am forgetful and I will just want to go next after my next game because I am incapable of stopping myself from playing, uh, which is what I spent this whole weekend doing instead of working on these slides. <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of times, like, I will screenshot these and I'll send them to my friends or I'll send them to, like, Raph's Discord or I'll send them to Reginomi. I'm just like, hey, like, this is, again, like, this is this was my situation here. I didn't know what to do. I found, or I found this interesting. What are your thoughts? Um, 
And I think that that's like a really, really good way to just like expose yourself to many opinions. Um, also, uh, full log reviews, very, very good. But like, you have to respect other people's time. It takes a whole lot of time and effort for someone to just do one log review for someone. And you need to be an active part of that conversation. Uh, if you want to do it by yourself, like for New York City members, we have the Naga thing that Eric and I run. Um, right now, I'm really the only one that ever uses that. So while I appreciate the points, um, it is meant to be available for everyone and really should be. Uh, don't be afraid of not understanding Naga. Uh, I think that's actually part of what the next lecture series is going to be on, is reaching out to some of the people that are a little more experienced with using it as a tool. But it's just like, make sure you're using them well if you do use them. Like, find the mistakes that Naga's saying you're making, and like, you know, so like, hey, like, I made this mistake. Like, what is this indicative of? You know, you can ask people, it's like, hey, like, how do I improve on this mistake? Or like, why is this happening? Don't worry, Mike. Just, if you win enough, your ego becomes unshakable. <laughs> but uh like but also like use like write down these situations where like you're confused and like go to the robots or go to people and like be proud of yourself when you play well like remembering like doing something well is just as good as remembering doing something badly if not better for actually like improving yeah and then the last part of these is study every like X and game, whatever, however you want to call it. Like set yourself a set interval of games. Um, for me, I try to do like I mean, I glance over like almost all the games that I play at this point because you know I just whether or not I'm salty or I'm just like interested in like something that happened at a certain point. Um, but like set yourself like a number of like you know every fifth game or every tenth game, whatever like you won't burn out on to just do like a deep dive because otherwise like it's really easy to just do like. Oh, you know, you got fourth because you lost two fights and then you were stuck pushing the entire game and you lost. And, you know, there were a few minor mistakes, but like really you pro could, you probably were just stuck at getting fourth this game because you lost a few fights. And that's not a very helpful review, but like you got fourth. So that's the game that you want to review, right? So by setting it in like a set interval, you can set a games where like, you know, you got first, but you made some mistakes that happened to work out for you. Or you got second and you should have gotten first because you took a fight that you really shouldn't have because you were in a comfortable point situation that led to you not winning. Uh, I mean, the, the goal of studying is to play, like, you get as exposed to as many situations as possible. And then if you play more and more situations better, like the results will come uh, with time and playing more. And then like, you actually have to play the game to get better. You can't just like listen to these lectures and then like, oh, suddenly I'm better at the game. You know, like, a lot of these concepts that I'm saying were like not super easy for me to write down because these are just things that I like know intuitively at this point. So I can use my brain power on things like tracking Tadashi and thinking about like, okay, what is the expected value here of me pushing this hand? Because my brain space is freed up because I like play my own hand automatically and understand like what are like the safest tiles here, which is not necessarily my ego talking. It's more of just like I have played so much Mahjong, especially online and studied so much Mahjong that these processes have kind of become like automatic, intuitive. Uh, the mental game of poker like calls this like unconscious competence, which is like the goal for all these things. Because the more things that are automatic, the more things you can pay attention to. Like the general process, information overload. When you're thinking about too many things, because you've learned like 17 new concepts and you're trying to implement them all at once, is you're just going to play way worse, and you're not actually going to implement any of those concepts because your brain like can't handle that much information. So you should just like take, you know, take some bite-sized topics, play, play some games with those topics in mind, like a few times in a row, like a few times, study them, have worse results because you're now thinking about something you did automatically. Uh, but then like you play to the point that you're no longer thinking about it. And all of a sudden, you know, you can focus on so many more things and now you have improved results. But like, you do actually need to play the game. Anyway, so this has been everything that I have. Um, honestly, it's just a whole bunch of thoughts that I wanted to put to paper. Um, if there's a topic that you would like to me to talk more about in depth, or you had specific questions, or you think you just have general feedback on things that could be improved with this, please feel free to DM me. Um, uh, my discord should be open. And if not, just add me as a friend. Uh, I add just about anyone and then tell people, no, I'm not interested in buying their art. Sorry. Uh, but if also, if you're not on discord. And you're seeing this later. Uh, I can be reached via email, uh, maxmodulealt at gmail.com that I only use for Mahjong. So feel free to sign it up for whatever DGen shit you want. Um, thanks again to everyone that helped me with this. Uh, 
I really appreciate. I'm really hopeful that like we can just get more English content out into the world because honestly, like I just kind of realized like you know I have read just about everything at this point, and so I would really really be interested in just seeing more and more uh, things. At this point, I'm ordering Japanese books and just trying to struggle my way through them just to find the what would you do sections and see if I can make them out. So yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, if there are any last minute questions, great. Otherwise, this has been it for me. And I appreciate you all sticking with me. Thank you very much, Max. Uh, this has been a very enlightening lecture, hopefully for a lot of you. And uh, you will see it on YouTube later. At this point, I'm going to stop the recording, but feel free to stick around for questions if you have any.